Jesus asked the Father that his followers might become perfectly one. John chapter 17 verses 20 to 23. I do not pray in behalf of these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. The glory which thou hast given me I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be perfectly one, so that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them even as thou hast loved me. More than 33,000 denominations Thousands of splinter groups, each claiming a silver of truth based on its private interpretations of the Bible, yet denying the unity that God desired for his church. The unity of the church in the New Testament, and for the first ten cent years, was understood to be an organic visible unity. Apostolic tradition and the teaching authority of the church were the internal cement. The visible unity was to be maintained in love by an authoritative teaching office. It was to be the observable basis upon which the world could draw the conclusion that the Father had sent the Son. Can the world see an invisible, intangible unity? The visible and organizational unity of the early church inspired the fear and admiration of the whole Roman Empire and eventually won it over. Schisms and factions were soundly condemned in the New Testament and by all subsequent generations. Paul urges for no divisions. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 10 to 11. I urge you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same purpose. For it has been reported to me about you, that there are rivalries among you. The concept of denominations was unheard of and unthinkable. The early church fought with all her strength and resources to keep the Lord's command and prayer for unity. She could never have conceived of the sad condition we see today. The majesty of the church has been reduced to thousands of beggarly groups disputing doctrine and competing for members. Using the Lord's criterion, we might ask if the world could observe the disunified churches today and believe that the Father sent the Son. No one claims the Catholic Church has been perfect, no one denies she needed great reformation during the 16th century. Much like the nation of Israel, she has gone through periods of decline and then great repentance and renewal. God always reforms his people. Israel never ceased to be God's people or his nation. The prophets never taught the people to ignore the traditions and interpret the Torah the way they individually wanted to. They were never encouraged to leave Israel during times of decline and establish their own little Israels, separating from the visible unity of Israel would have been unthinkable to Jews. Their visible, organic unity was a crucial foundational element of their covenant. Now that the covenant has expanded to include all men and not merely the Jews, why do we think that the covenant would be qualitatively different? Why should it be assumed that the covenant people would not continue to be a visible society with recognizable leadership? The scriptures and the history of the early church give no basis for such a covenantal deviation. The Reformation principle of each man with a Bible and his own interpretation has brought about the tragic results we see today. The results are everywhere obvious and devastating, as the Reformation has spun out of control. The Protestant Reformation was actually an act of negation. Protestants overreacted and cut too much flesh away from the bone. What resulted was a mere skeleton of the Church Christ had intended. 
they had no patience and no confidence in the ability of the Holy Spirit to reform the church. The scriptures teach us that no prophesy is a matter of private interpretation. The second letter of Peter chapter 1 verses 22-21, First of all you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by the impulse of man, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And that many distort Paul's writings to their own destruction, the second letter of Peter chapter 3 verses 15 to 16, So also our beloved brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, speaking of this as he does in all his letters. There are some things in them hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. The Bible was never meant to be read in a cavalier manner, outside the tradition and teaching of the church. This, however, is not to diminish the need for individual Christians to read and understand the Bible, quite the contrary. It is not an either-or statement, either the Church or the Holy Spirit, it is a both-and statement, both the Church and the Holy Spirit, in fact the Holy Spirit in the Church. The scriptures were meant to be read, interpreted, and practiced within the community of the Church, under the leadership of the Magistrium, and in light of apostolic tradition. If the Church has no teaching authority by which to interpret these inspired writings, then everyone's individual and contradictory interpretation or opinion is equally valid, since it claims to be from the Holy Spirit, and this completely nullifies and desires any existence of unity or sanity in the body of Christ and makes a mockery of absolute truth and unity, if private interpretation is the final criterion, who has the right to condemn the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses, who are interpreting the Bible according to their own principles and private judgment? The Christian cults have every right to look the evangelical in the eye and say, we did not establish independent interpretation of scripture as the highest authority. You did this. Now, on what basis do you say our interpretation is wrong? You have cast aside the tradition of the early church and rejected the teaching, authority and cling to your new doctrine of sola scriptura. Who are you to condemn us? You say private interpretation is the highest principle of the Christian faith and then claim your interpretation is only correct one. Make up your mind. All we've done is follow your principles out to their logical conclusions. By necessity, moreover, each must deny that the other has the Spirit. If you had the Holy Spirit leading you into all truth, you would certainly agree with me, since the Holy Spirit led me to this contradictory interpretation. We are thus brought back to the question, what does this Bible verse mean to you? In the light of this it is very interesting that there are major movements afoot at this very moment to challenge and reopen the canon of scripture. Since there is no real authority in the Protestant camp, there is no one there who can authoritatively resist such a challenge. Upon what basis would the Protestant object to reopening the canon for the inclusion of additional inspired writings? Upon the basis of an internal witness. Whose internal witness? Denominations frantically dig new ponds each generation and wade around splashing in the shallow eddies, but the Catholic Church has a depth that is unfathomable. When one enters the Church, he finds that the Church is glorious, beautiful, and splendid, like a massive creature, too grand and colossal to comprehend fully, yet modest and personal enough to put affectionately in your pocket. It was a fullness. Why the term fullness? Because Catholic Church encompasses so much more than we had ever known in our Protestant past. The fullness of the faith carefully preserved and nurtured through endless centuries. We are not going from Christian to Catholic, as though we're leaving the Christian part behind. We are developing and experiencing the Christian faith more fully by becoming Catholic Christians. Catholicism is ancient, yet forever young, it is constant and firm, 
yet forever lively and robust. It is old, yet always new and vital. When one enters the church, he finds that the church is much larger inside than it is outside. The church is full of untold riches, saints, martyrs, confessors, bishops, depths of devotion, prayers of gold, traditions of inestimable value, a treasure chest of writings, history, stories of love, truth, and courage in which to immerse oneself. It fills the soul with a thirst to read, 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 and to pray, pray, pray. There is no end to the pleasures awaiting the orphan who repatriates to the one, holy, Catholic and Apostolic Church. Catholicism is the voice of sanity. G.K. Chesterton describes the opposition as rags and tatters of stale slander and muddle-headedness which I am obliged to put first as the official policy of the opposition to the Church. These stale stories seem to count for a great deal with people who are resolved to keep far away from the Church. I do not believe they ever counted with anybody who had begun to draw near to it. Catholicism is the only thing that saves a man from the degrading slavery of being a child of his time. Stephen Ray says, The more information we gather and study, the more our decision is confirmed, and the more we want to shout it from the housetops. The closer we drew to the church and to our final decision to cross the Tiber, the more we realized how hollow and uninformed the clamor against the church is. Janet and I happily rest in the sanity, peace, truth, and salvation of the Catholic faith. We stand in visible unity and a most profound historical continuity with the Lord Jesus, the Apostles, the Fathers, the Martyrs, the Saints, and the whole, glorious Catholic Church. Here I stand, I can do no other. We are not the first to cross the Tiber, we won't be the last, we are in good company.